Thank you all for joining Literacy Instruction for Multilingual uh, Learners. And I am Elsa Cardenas Hagen from the Valley Speech Language and Learning Center and from the University of Houston Times, the Texas Institute for Measurement, Evaluation and Statistics. And today we're going to be talking about um, multilingual learners and all that we should know about them. But before I begin, I cannot begin without thanking all of my wonderful colleagues and the persons that I've worked with for now, uh, getting close to 25 years on conducting these national research studies on English learners. And so as we look across the whole United States, we have, you know, 5 million of these students and Spanish is the most common language. Arabic is the second most common language. And we know that these students are falling behind and we know about the pandemic and what this is, you know, we've been very concerned about all students, but especially these students from diverse populations. And how did this journey begin? How did we start? Um, and really it's been so fascinating to be there from the beginning of these big initiatives. But uh, we started first when the National Literacy um, National Reading Panel report came out and that was in the year 2000. And it did not include the studies on English learners. Uh, the decision was to just focus on English and those students who speak English as their native language, right? And that was about the time we started what's called the Biliteracy Research Next Network for the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the Institute for Education Sciences, IES, which is the research arm of the United States Department of Education. And so by 2006, we had enough studies from the Biliteracy Research Network to really talk about you know, this meta-analysis that came out in 2006 and Diane and Tim, Diane August and Timothy Shanahan, Tim Shanahan, um, you know, really led the charge on this. And it was to look at, you know, what is it about these students and what must we be thinking about as we work with them in a very comprehensive approach to literacy. And so what I have right here on this slide is if you look on the left, we know from the National Reading Panel report, everyone knows, all right, they really describe phonological awareness as well, some of the key information in those early years plus phonics. They develop their fluency and all the while we're working on vocabulary and comprehension. In the beginning, we're working on oral language and oral language vocabulary. And then that moves into that reading comprehension and reading vocabulary. What's different? What about language minority children? This is demonstrated here in the National Literacy Panel Report. And what from all looking at all those studies was really to say, we must adjust instruction. And that instruction has to meet the students at their point of need. And please know that language, right? is on a continuum of development as well as literacy. There's a continuum of literacy development. And so as you work with these students, we have to understand that language development, right? In first and second language, as well as that literacy development in first and second language. But the beautiful thing and in all the research that I've been in has been Spanish speaking English learners is that there's so many cross linguistic features. These are assets that we must use. And I don't have to speak the language to take advantage, I can take advantage of these assets, right? And so very clearly for these students, as you work with them in your classrooms, you may not know the language, but it is up to you. It's up to you to determine what are those cross-linguistic features. And we can use those as a resource. And I like to give out like my languages, I think it's .org, something like that, where you can look up all the features of all the sounds of all these languages, more than 100 languages of what is the same with English. But the beauty about this report is to demonstrate to you how important and how beautiful the native language is. Because students that have that native language and have native language literacy are going to perform much higher, right? in English literacy than those who were just only instructed in English only. So, so in other words, if I'm just doing English immersion, that's not as uh, great as having native language literacy skills 
that is such an asset. It supports that second language uh, literacy. And there isn't any research that is available to discredit you know, this work from the National Literacy Panel on Language Minority Children and Youth. And so I want that message to be very clear. And as you think about you know, the services and your models and your design, just know having native language solid and having native language literacy supports second language literacy. Another body of evidence from the National Academies of Sciences engineering and medicine. And this came out in 2017. Also another consensus report looking at how can we promote that success of children and youth that are learning English, right? And once again, what do we find from the review of all the studies that developing literacy amongst English learners, right, is going to mean that we have to be explicit in providing that instruction. And what what do we see in that instruction? We must have phonological awareness. Well, they called it phoneme awareness, that phoneme matters, that individual sound. Phonics, that matters too. Having that ability for oral reading fluency. All the while, we must be working on vocabulary, reading comprehension, and they extended. No, the National Literacy Panel Report for Language Minority Children and Youth did not include writing, but this consensus study report did include writing. And we're so pleased about that because certainly writing is a part of literacy, is it not? It is, of course. So two huge reports there. Now, what did this report say? Well, yes, you're gonna not only provide that explicit instruction in those five components of literacy that we know of, but we have to be developing the students' academic language all across the day, all across the content areas. And we know that these students very much respond to visual supports and verbal supports to really make that core content comprehensible. And the more that you capitalize upon my home language, my background knowledge, and using my cultural culture as an asset, the better for the student, right? And the more opportunity I have to work with my peers and have lots of extra practice in these small groups, the better for these students. Now, it has been very controversial. I don't know. Uh, so in some states, uh, not in the state that I live in, to screen, to screen for those language and literacy challenges and to monitor the progress. And I have something to say to you today about this. We uh, developed universal screenings in 1997-98 to be used for the entire state of Texas, both in English and in Spanish. And we've been using those tools for more than two decades now, right? And what I want to say is it's, you know, we didn't use them to diagnose a reading disability such as dyslexia. We used them to find students who weren't on target when compared to their peers. We used those screenings to help us determine, right, what kind of extra instruction do these students need and can we prevent some reading difficulties? Can we get into those small groups, right, to support their language and their literacy skills? And I asked the state to tell me, all right, so many people are concerned about over-identification. Uh, later, in later years, about up to like five years ago, uh, there was a screening for dyslexia. So uh, we have had in our state, and we have a million English learners in our state, um, we have been having universal screenings three times a year in kinder through third grade. And today I want to tell you, the, and it might be because we also have so much dedication, so much opportunity um, to really provide, you know, solid instruction based upon the evidence, based upon the science of what we know. And our teachers have had, we have these reading academies that they've gone through with their principals with their literacy coaches with the portfolios and demonstrating that they have the knowledge and applying it and today I want to tell you when there's been some studies looking at uh, three different states the students 
that are from these diverse populations are under under identified for issues such as dyslexia. And when they get to middle school, that's when they get identified and they will get identified two to three years later than a monolingual English speaking peer. All right. And currently right now, after all these decades of this work, you know, and people are saying, oh, they're all going to be identified with dyslexia. If there's these dyslexia screeners, it's less than 1% are getting identified with dyslexia currently. So, so it may be, okay, maybe it's that we're doing a great job, right? Or is it that they're there and that we're not identifying them? So I know there's been so much concern, but if we can look at them in kindergarten, there are so many markers in kindergarten, what, no matter the language, no matter if I'm in Spanish or English or Arabic in alphabetic languages, if I don't know my letters and sounds and you worked on it the whole year and I still don't have that down, if I still don't have phonological awareness, I can't blend sounds together. I can't blend, uh, you know, tell you sounds in words. That is a problem. And that's a risk factor. And we need to try and give that extra help and support. That's what I do have to say. We have just finished this very important work that I want to share with you. And this you can get at mtss, the number four, lzels.org. And we have recently on this project that we just finished five briefs, uh, five literacy briefs that are easy to read. And uh, what we were looking at is, all right, so now you want us to do, you know, this tiered system of support for our students. What does it take for students in this diverse population who don't speak English as their first language? It takes differentiation. It takes understanding, just like I started this session, understanding that language development. Where am I? Am I at the beginning stage of my second language? Am I at the intermediate stage? Am I advanced? How am I doing in my native language anyway, by the way? Is that intact, right? And what about my literacy skills? Am I just showing you foundational skills right now of literacy or am I more at an intermediate or an advanced level of literacy? So I have to be aware of their language capabilities and that language proficiency and their literacy levels. And you see right here that we talk about in, in, in this brief, we talk about culturally relevant principles applied to instruction and assessment. Now, what do we know from the research world? What do we know about that? What we know is that's not gonna teach you to read, but what we do know is it's going to increase your engagement and your motivation. And really it's so wonderful to see yourself in perhaps the text that you're demonstrating, the subject matter that you're discussing, that's motivating and it feels wonderful to be included and represented. Does it teach me to read? No, but it gets me engaged and enthusiastic about my learning. But as I'm working, what I want to say is you're a language teacher, no matter what you teach, and you're a literacy teacher, no matter what subject matter you teach. There's language in math, language in science, language in social studies, science in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and of course in language arts. So we want to provide listening, speaking, reading, and writing opportunities, right? And right now we're in another project called Model Demonstration for Dyslexia. And in the school districts that we're in, we had to call our project officer and say, hello, project officer, you know, at the Department of Education, can we have this one school year to work on the core instruction? Because how can we work on dyslexia if in the core, they're not providing these opportunities of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then we don't know if in fact it really was a dyslexia or dystichia, right? So we got to get that squared away so that then we can tell you yes or no, hello, how we're doing in that development of literacy. And is are these students showing risk factors or are they indeed demonstrating dyslexia? And what do we do about it? So this takes human capital and you're the human capital. And I'm glad you're here today 
Some of you are leaders. Some of you are practitioners, right? Some of you are decision makers, maybe at the state or at the local agencies or regional agencies. But what I want to tell you is that we need to, we really need to think about the structure, the framework from which we will deliver these services and how well we're gonna be using native language support or using that cross-linguistic feature and how knowledgeable are the educators in our state in regards to native language development, second language development, literacy development in one language and two? That's my question for you. So these briefs should be very helpful to you and I hope you will read them. That's your assignment. I'm giving you an assignment already. Now, here's another framework that you'll find in these briefs. So you have seen this, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier one being core, tier two, extra intervention, tier three might be still in general education or special education, depends on how you model it. But notice here, we have here, ah, are we looking at their language proficiency? Are we looking at, are they at basic language, intermediate language, or advanced language in first and second language? And then you'll see CLRT. How are we doing in that culturally, linguistically responsive teaching, right? Are we taking into consideration all the different types of students that we have there, all the different languages, all the different cultures, so that we can get them engaged and motivated? They have something to connect to. All right. And so you'll read that in those briefs. I already gave you a homework assignment. You have, there's really 10 briefs in there. Uh, if you want to read the five that we wrote, no, my colleagues wrote the other five, but that's okay. They're all wonderful. You will read. Another tool I want to give you. We have, when you go to MTSS 4Ls, uh, a rubric for you to really reflect upon and think about how you're delivering these multi-tiered systems that support your framework, and whether you are really considering these students who are multilingual learners, and whether you're considering that while you're doing that you know, universal screening, while you're uh, designing that instruction, while you're treating and monitoring the progress, um, and how well you're, you're able to meet the student at their point of need. And so, Right there in that website, we have these tools and these tools have an MTSS rubric and also a scoring worksheet and also some action plans. So you have a lot of homework already. I'm giving you homework to look at those literacy briefs and look at the tools that are available for you to think about how do we do this work and also consider that they are learning more than one language and more than one system of reading. All right, so I'm a speech and language pathologist. And of course I cannot let you get away from here without thinking of the components of language, right? And so when we think about back in 1978, Dr. Bloom and Leahy um, had a definition of language as a code whereby, you know, it's this, you know, true understanding of this, these signals for communication that are agreed upon as a conventional system. And that system includes components. And these components are what we're gonna work through today. As I teach you the strategies and routines today, it's all built on the foundation of language. And this is what I want to tell you. Every language in the world has the system of phonology. Every language has sounds and our students must be able to process the sounds and produce those sounds, right? Every language in the world has semantics, words in their language. And those words, I have to understand the words receptively, right? My receptive vocabulary, and I have to be able to express them. And by the way, I have to use a word anywhere from 12 to 15 times to really demonstrate that I truly have knowledge of that word. So we've got to think about creative ways in which they can use this targeted vocabulary that's so necessary. Every language in the world has, if you look at words, words have sub meanings. So they have these little units of meaning within them that we call morphology, the morphemes, the smallest unit of meaning in a language. And the beautiful part about that 
is if I speak a language that's Latin, that, you know, my native language were Latin based or based upon the Greek or had something like that, that's wonderful for learning English. Why? 60% of the English language comes from Latin. Another 15% comes from the Greek. And so if you think about that, oh, that's about 75%. And common everyday words for us in our language of Spanish, my, I'm a Spanish speaker, right? They're high level words in English. And sometimes even bilingual educators or educators who speak both languages and have all these certifications, sometimes they don't think about that. Even my son, he was in high school. He was like, mom, what does the word placate mean? And I turned to him and I said, Cuando mami te dice aplacate. I use that word every day. You know how, what it means? We calm, calm down, right? You say calm. I say in my language, placate. My son said, que fácil. You say easy. We say in our language, facile. So we use very um, high level vocabulary and much of it can transfer to the English language. So that's using that native language as a resource. But first we have to know about it. Syntax. These are the ways that words can go together or not go together in a language. And if I know, how to formulate sentences, that's wonderful because that will help me in that second language, but then I have to learn the rules of the second language. Well, oh, that structure doesn't quite work in this new language of English. Oh, no, adjectives right? go before the noun, not after the noun, those kinds of things. But here's the icing on the cake that I'm still working on. You might consider me an advanced English language speaker, but I am still learning pragmatics. That's all about the use of the language. And you know what bothers me about my pragmatic language skills, first of all, is that there are so many sayings and idioms, whether they be local or regional or national, I don't know all of them. And I love learning about them still after all of these years. And so it's wonderful to understand how to use the language. And that means the social use of the language and the academic use. and. We have to know about those language registers because typically when we're learning another language, we learn the social use. You're trying to teach us the academic use and we've got to know which registers of language to use. My colleague, Julie Washington, will talk about you know, African-American English and says, you know, these dialectical variations exist like English learners and they use their social form and you're trying to teach them the academic form. And that's what we're striving for, academic language skills. So how does this all fit into the views that you know about? You know about this simple view of reading from Goff and Tummer, and you know that you know, there's these profiles. And so I've got to have these basic foundational skills of being able to read the words in front of me and all the while have great comprehension so I can get to that skilled reading. And the ultimate goal of reading is comprehension. And Hollis Scarborough, you know, she actually drew this rope and said, all right, if I were to take that simple view of reading and look at decoding, what goes into that? Yeah, I have to have those foundational skills of phonological awareness. That'll help me know my letters and sounds and read the words in front of me. Oh, when I have phonological awareness, it'll help my spelling too. And I have to instantly recognize that word and build that automaticity and fluency. But I must also be working on the student's background knowledge, their world knowledge, expanding their vocabulary, giving them opportunities to use language, giving them opportunities to you know, put two and two together and to reason and make inferences, and also then to understand the type of text that we're gonna be reading and all the different structures of that text. I have to become strategic thinker, right? And I will not, have that skill of reading, true literacy, unless I truly have that language comprehension with that foundation. Sometimes I get students that they have beautiful language and beautiful comprehension, but they can't decode, right? Oftentimes that's my students with dyslexia. Or I might have the students that, oh, you know what? They can read anything, but they don't understand what they're reading. And I've got to really ensure that understanding. So it's like, you know, where this meets. And, and Hollis drew this and she says, you know, uh, I drew it tighter and tighter and tighter to show that skilled reading is over here. Over here, it's not all formulated and all 
you know, achieved until they really have all of these components in place. So in 2014 at the International Dyslexia Association, we came up with this term called structured literacy that was based upon language. And it was really to understand what do we mean about this very comprehensive approach to literacy? It means that you have to work on the speech sound system, that phonology. You have to think about how that those sounds form together to form words and how those words work in a sentence. You have to be able to spell them and write them. You have to understand the meaning. And one of the ways we can understand the meaning is by, you know, really thinking about, oh, do I already know this meaning? There's some word parts in there that can help me. Um, but we know that the students need opportunity for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And they also need something else. Touch the front part of your brain right here. This is your prefrontal lobe cortex. You know what you need? Attention, concentration. You need working memory skills, right? You need reasoning skills to be truly, truly, truly at that highest level of reading comprehension. That's the goal, reading comprehension. What does it mean as you're thinking about biliteracy? And I propose it means these two systems, minimal two or maybe even more, three, but you know those systems, their phonology, the sounds, their morphology, those words and word meanings, the semantics, the orthography, the spelling, and that you understand how the language works, both in spoken and written form, so that you can listen, speak, read, and write. But we're talking about using those culturally and linguistically responsive practices. And that very much uh, will make such a difference for these students. So the work that we've been doing these last couple of decades have really um, looked at students who are Spanish speaking because that's close to 80% of the students speak Spanish in their home. And so if you look there on the left, this is our studies where we worked really, I want to tell you, we worked for 10 years on these studies. And uh, we found that these students who were very much at risk, way below the 25th percentile in reading, uh, that we could get statistically significant results in literacy. If we worked on those foundational skills, phonological awareness and phonics, as we worked on oral language proficiency, as we front loaded and prepared them for what the lesson was going to entail, what language demands were we going to have in this lesson, right? What vocabulary demands? And we had scaffolds for these students. We also did, not, I don't have it here, the very same kind of work in the Spanish language. So as we were do, doing these studies in English, we were also doing them in Spanish and we got some great results. Linnea Ari, if you'll look over there on the right side of your uh, frame here on the slide, she also uh, has looked at this population of students and found these great positive statistically significant results when the students not only were learning to read, but they also had opportunities vocabulary and applying meaning to those words and all those wonderful visual supports that the students were needing. All right. And so you can read about these studies in uh, the IES practice guide, the Institute for Education Sciences practice guides on how to develop, you know, this academic language and literacy amongst these students. So the literacy supports that we provided are as follows. Think about the language demands. Think about the vocabulary demands and have those specific targets within your lessons. And that was essential for us, especially for these students that were very, very below, you know, the level, the expected level when we compared them to their peers, right? And that really was helping to meet their language needs as well as their literacy needs. And that maximizes the instruction. So what's your job? Right here on this slide, what I have for you is if we could just even think about the consonants that transfer across the languages. So here's the common Spanish language. And what I demonstrate to you here is guess what? If I already have this in my native language, it all transfers. I don't need to start for a high students. Let me show you the letter B. It says B, I already know that. And I already know the C says K and the D says D and the F says F and the G. We don't give the students credit and we have to think about the assets that they already have 
and we need to use them in our instruction. So look here, I already know these concepts in English because if I already have them in Spanish, they transfer 100% to English. These are them. So, b, k, m, d, g, k, u, m, m, u is even in there, and k, s, the x. Arabic, if your students speak Arabic, look at the examples here also. B, d, k, u, m, j, m, u, m, y, z, sh. Look at Vietnamese and English. Notice some patterns here. Gosh, some of the bilabial sounds, right? Some of those um, alveolar sounds. So they transfer. What an asset. Let's build upon them. Do I speak Vietnamese? Do I speak Arabic? No, no. But I help my colleagues, right? In Kuwait, I help them to develop a program to be explicit and systematic in Arabic so that they could work with students with reading difficulties. What are the challenging sounds of English? Those short vowel sounds, ah, eh, eh, oh, uh, right? The schwa sound, sounds like j. The th has two sounds, one is voice, the other one is voiceless, sh versus ch. And that z sound that you might find in a word like treasure, measure, explosion, intrusion, that er, in Spanish, we want to say er, right? As two sounds instead of one. Ah, mm. Those are challenging sounds. So what kind of connection can you make? I propose to you as follows. I have trouble. One of the challenging sounds of English is that letter J. It says J. But did you know I have in my Spanish language the sound for CH? Put your hand on your vocal cords right now. Touch your throat, put your hands right there and say the CH sound to yourself. Ch, ch, ch. Your vocal cords did not vibrate. Now I want you to say that sound. Ch, ch, ch. But I want you to say it with voicing. <gasps> j, j, j. Turn off your voice box. Ch, ch, ch. Turn it on. J, j, j. Those are the same exact sounds. The only difference? Voicing. That's the only difference. So now I know this new sound. You're going to teach me how I'm going to write it and spell it and read it. In Spanish, I have this D sound, and it sounds a little bit different. Show me everyone your finger, and I'm going to spell, I'm going to say the word for finger in Spanish, D-E-D-O. But listen carefully as I say this word. Look at my mouth. Dedo. Dedo. I had two Ds there. First D was similar to English. De. But the second D, the, the Spanish D, when it's between two vowels, is the English TH, the voiced. So when they write for you a word like father with the letter D in the middle, I say, good for you. You heard the sound correctly. You used your Spanish letter of D. In English, we use TH. Mother, not M A, right? M M O D E R, but M. O-T-H-E-R. Oh, here's the Spanish vowel, U. My Spanish vowel, U, I have some new boots on. Or look at the moon. For boot, I might want to write B-U-T. But what I want to say to you is the U in Spanish is the English O-O, that digraph O-O that says U. So if they write boot as B-U-T, Good for you. You got the sounds right. But the way we write this in English is with O-O. The Spanish U is the English O-O. I want to trill my R's in Spanish. But in English, it's not trilled. But I also have the word, for example, for face, cara. Or the word for a pair, pera, pera. So that R in the medial position is what we call the soft R and it transfers directly to English. And we call it a flap. See this, this is my tongue. It's flapping up and down, up and down, up and down. Say these words in English, say letter, ladder, better, gotta. The, the Spanish R when it's between two vowels is the English medial T and D. So when they write letter, L-E-R-E-R, -E -R, good for you. That's the right sound, it's a flap. 
It's not trilled, but in English, right? We're going to either use T or D. Ladder. It's not L-A-R-E-R. -E it's with a D. L-A-D-D-E-R. So there's some connections to be made. We don't have that in Arabic, right? But in Arabic, we do have B. Put your hands on your vocal cords. Say what we have in Arabic. B. Turn off your voice box in Arabic. Now you have the new sound of English, which you don't have in Arabic. Arabic doesn't have that sound. Put your hand and say, your vocal cords vibrate. This time, just give me air. Don't vibrate. Those are the same sounds. The only difference is voicing. Those S consonant blends are so challenging, right? Because we don't have them. For example, we don't have those in Spanish in the initial position or in Arabic. So they add the extra vowel, you know? I speak a Spanish and I like a spaghetti for lunch and I want a Sprite to drink. So I tell them, no, show me your teeth, Sprite, spaghetti, Spanish. Do not open your mouth, right? And do not put an extra vowel there. But why do we do that? Because we don't have those S consonant blends in the initial position. What about Vietnamese? In Vietnamese, it's mostly one or two syllable words, right? So what's challenging about English is there's very words with very long, they're very long and they have three, four or five syllables. Those consonant clusters just for like the speakers of Spanish and Arabic, those are challenging. And the new sound of ch, that's challenging. But can I use some sound approximations? All right, what do I mean by sound approximation? So I don't have that ch. And I don't have that j, you know, j, right? But I do have sh. So everyone say sh. The middle of your tongue is at the roof of your mouth. And you stretched out that sound, sh. Now I want you to say sh, but I want you to shorten it. You can get to ch. Let's do the ZH. That sounds for z. But now let me shorten it and release it, j. That can be an approximation. So these are the ways we can make connections for Spanish, for Arabic, for Vietnamese, and other languages as well, right? So these are the routines. These are the things that we have to really be thinking about, right? So as we think about these, how wonderful to be thinking about this, how wonderful to take it from an asset point of view, and how wonderful for you to know this information so that you can make those connections with your students. This is what we want to impart with you, right? Why those errors? I love errors because they inform instruction. I know what the students are thinking. I know why they're reading it this way, writing it this way, spelling it this way, but I have to be that informed instructor. All right? Awesome, thank you so much. So now, if we look at those foundational skills and if we look at those connections across languages and if we take advantage of them, Gosh, it's so wonderful. If I had native language literacy and that native language opportunity, and I already can demonstrate those foundational skills of phonological awareness, guess what? In our studies, we found that the connection, for example, between Spanish and English, uh, other languages like Italian and English, many other languages, the connection is for many of the language of 0.92. We are 0.08 off from it being a perfect correlation. So, what about that 0 0.08? What can I do that's different? Well, let me kind of focus on, let's remember that new sound we were talking about just a while ago, that j sound. I can design my lessons around that sound j. If you already have this skill in your native language, let me just check out the new language. We say that the Spanish language has about 22 sounds. Some will say 24. The English language has about 44 sounds. Some will say 46. So no matter how you look at it, English has doubled the number of sounds. And by the way, English has the most sounds of any language, right? More than Arabic, more than Vietnamese, more than Spanish. So if we look at this, and I want to do the lesson this way, this is how I'm going to be responsive to my students. This is how I'm going to capitalize on what they already know. So let's say they have phonological awareness in their language, but what about these new sounds? Let me try a phoneme substitution test with them, but let me target the new sound. Say the word ham. Change ha to j. What would be the new word? Jam. What am I going to do different for the English learner? 
I might say jam and not even know what that is, right? So I'm going to connect meaning to it. Take an opportunity for vocabulary. And by the way, jam has multiple meanings, right? So uh, I can jam to the music today, right? Um, I can be in a traffic jam there in Oregon. I can have some strawberry jam on my toasted bread, right? Say the word bet. We're going to change bet to jet. What would that be? Jet. All right. And so also that has multiple meanings too. You know, these simple words that you talk about, they often have multiple meanings, but this is what I'm going to do that's different. I'm going to take what they know. I'm going to look at what are some challenging sounds and do they have these, once I get these sounds, do they also have them for that phonological awareness? And then how does that apply to the writing, to the spelling, to the reading? Let me make that connection for them. And that's not that hard to do, but now I'm really responding and differentiating my instruction based upon their needs. So I might say, hey, let's make a connection. Say these words after me. And as you say these words, I want you to be listening to the common sound. Now we're gonna link that phoneme to the graphene. We're gonna link what they're processing in the sounds to those letter sound correspondences. And I want them, and I tell them exactly the purpose of what they're gonna be doing. Absolutely, I do. And so we might look at that and I'm gonna say, tell me the sounds that you hear that are, you know, the same in each of these words. So I say the words, let's now let me show you the letter, what looks the same. Now let's make a connection to this new sound. I can give you a word like Jaguar in English. And guess what? I use that word because it was connected in Spanish. I use J for Jaguar. It's a different sound. I have a new sound in the English language, but there's a connection. And so I ask them about, what do you already know about this letter? Well, tell me about this. I don't speak your language. So tell me about this letter in your language. What sound does it make? How do you represent it, right? And that's really capitalizing upon theirs and them showing us, and perhaps you're learning more about the connections to be made. Now, in the English language, we show and very clearly demonstrate with them uh, we show them these, um, these connections across the languages, right? And I don't have to learn these syllable types in other languages and, or not in transparent languages, because for example, in the transparent language of Spanish, the vowel sounds never change, but my, the patterns look similar to me. So here I have this word in Spanish, then, right? In English, I have something similar, 10. Oh, look, there's a vowel and a consonant there. I have to learn that in English, when do I say the short vowel sounds? When there's at least one consonant after that vowel. And that's what I'm going to say. Ah, eh, eh, ah, ah. But in Spanish, I'm always going to say the same vowels. I don't really need to learn that syllable type. But there's a connection to be made. In English, I say no. In Spanish, I say no, right? But look here, that ended. It's a syllable there. It ended in a vowel. In English, that vowel is going to be long. It'll say its name. So it's either going to say A-E-I-O-U. No one ever taught us this when we were learning English as our second language. What I want to say is my language supports my reading and my reading supports my language. And although people might call me a phonicator, <laughs> I'm wild beyond that. I'm not just a phonicator telling you about phonological awareness and phonics. We're always embedding language into everything that we do so that we can build their language skills as we're building their literacy skills. Look here, the, to you in English, every, every first grade teacher teaches this, vowel, consonant, E. That says dame in English. But look, I have something that looks the same in Spanish. Dame means something different, pronounced differently, right? And I never knew that you had to have a silent E in English and that the vowel was going to be long because we produce all the vowel sounds in Spanish. Here's my vowel pair. I have IE in English, pi. But in Spanish, I say pie. It looks similar, but no, it's not pronounced the same. It doesn't have the same meaning, right? It might look like a cognate looking similar, but it's not. But look, I have those vowel pairs, right? They exist in many languages. Here's that vowel R. So in Spanish, I would say mar. So that really represents two sounds in the Spanish language. But in English, it represents one sound, R. I have these final stable syllables like bull and pull. 
right? But in Spanish, I always pronounce that final E, cable. And my vowel sounds are different, right? So I can make some connections amongst the patterns, but I've got to teach them about why do the vowel sounds change in English? And here are the six syllable types of English. And once I know that, that can really get me to be a better reader. Now, if I looked here, remember we were doing that sound j, and we were practicing it in phonological awareness and we were practicing, we looked at the letter and sound. Now I want you to read some words about it. Oh my God, this is just to see. Could you, can you read these closed syllables with that vowel sound? This is pretty darn boring, right? When we look at this, but I just want to see, can you decode these? But we're going to embed language into this, right? So here we have, uh, I tell them to prepare, to read. Now, remember, we have our pattern here. Remember about the vowel sounds. They're going to be the short ones. Ready? Let's read. And so they'll read it. And then we'll go through that. And so as I'm having them read, and then we'll practice, and we do those repeated readings, what have you. But I'm going to bring in, remember those components of language? I'm going to ask them about, okay, students, let's look at these words. Ah, you did the j sound and you did those short vowel sounds. But now, can you tell me, can you read the words that not only have that j, but what about the ones that also have a ah after it? And they might read jam, jab, jam. Or I might say, can you read the word that rhymes with pet? And they might read jet. That's really focusing on the sound features of the language. I have them prepare this next row. They're all going to have those closed syllables with the short vowels. Ready, read. Jim, job, Jack, Jen, just. Very good. We're going to do some more reading with this. Now let me ask you some questions. If you look at that row too, which one of those words can be can mean someone's work? Read it. Find it. Read it. Job. Very good. Which one of those words are person's names? Jim, Jack, Jen. Very good. How did you know? It had a capital letter. Very nice. Let's look at this next row. You read those very beautifully. Now let me ask you a question. Which one of those words can be a noun, a verb, and an adjective? I'm asking you about grammar here. And they might say something like jet, right? Or they may not know, right? But the jet is another word for airplane. After this webinar is over with, you're gonna jet out of that room and go do something fun. Or I have jet black hair, right? Same thing with jig, right? You can do that dance or I can jig the fishing line or I have a jigsaw puzzle. So they look so simple, but we can think deeper about these words. But remember what I said about the pragmatic language features. Let's look here. Just jam, jig, jab, jet. Ah, uh, how about if I said something like I was only kidding that phrase? What word could I use in place of only? I was just kidding. Or the judge gave a very fair sentence to uh, the person who was guilty. Word might be just. Or I'm stuck in that traffic, what? Jam. Or I'm going to jam to the music, right? That would be a phrase, a saying that maybe I'm not familiar with as an English learner. So what I want to show you here and demonstrate here is here's a decoding practice, focusing on that phonics knowledge of that letter J, representing J, focusing on those closed syllables, but we brought in language. And guess what the students do? Because we make this a routine. They start to think about the sound features, the meaning features, the syntax, pragmatics, and use. And there's my visual supports, and we'll have discussions, right, for my visual and verbal supports that we always want to have for our students. So those were foundational skills, right? So we worked on, here's some phonological awareness considerations for these students. Here's some phonics consideration, taking it from an asset point of view. What do they already know? What connections can I make? What about that reading? But what I want you to know about reading fluency for these students is oftentimes uh, we can get them to that point of being able to decode, but we've got to be ensuring that they are not un that they are also understanding as they're reading. And don't think that just because their reading fluency is improving, that their comprehension is improving because that reading fluency and that compre comprehension is moderated by that oral language proficiency level, right? 
And so in the foundational skills, as they're reading and building fluency, they might need some work on the phrasing, the expression, but certainly on the vocabulary and making sure that we have the oral language necessary uh, to really uh, get to that goal of reading comprehension. But all the while, as I mentioned to you, that we're not only thinking about foundational skills of literacy, that we've got to be building vocabulary. And as we think about this, it's really great when they can learn a set of vocabulary words around a central topic, central theme, and that we have lots of different activities. Remember, I want you to come up with a minimum of 12 different opportunities to use the words, right? So we can play games with words. We can bring this in. They know that what we're gonna do. So here, well, here was just an example. And here I had this, um, this would be like us working on that fluency practice, really working on the phrasing. I can use my pencil swings. I can re-emphasize and show them kind of the nuances of the language. If I were to read this and emphasize Jim, let's read it emphasizing Jim. Jim makes rings for his job. Ah, so we're thinking about the person, Jim. Now let's emphasize makes rings. Jim makes rings for his job. Do you see how that, just that little bit, I'm thinking about the action of what he's doing. And so we can do this kind of work with our students just for them to pick up on what I call those super segmental features of the language that oftentimes can subtly change, right? What that main idea is. And so that's a lot of fun. And then we can work on the things you've learned about. You all know this already. You know that we can take advantage of words that are similar across languages. We call those cognates. Uh, I discussed earlier about putting together those morphemes that are so wonderful and that we can make the connections. And here I just give you the example of canoe and just looking in... Um, I, I do a lot of work in, in Barcelona. And so in Catalan, they speak three languages. So Catalan is the native language, Spanish, second language, English, third language. But it's so interesting to see that it's, you know, how Catalan is so closely related to English. Uh, and so you see there, you know, here we have an English canoe and in Spanish and Italian, Portuguese, you know, canoa. And look at French and German. Gosh, look at these cognates that we can kind of pick up. And we can take, remember what I was telling you, take it you know, around a topic. And there's lots of uh, different websites that have, I know in Colorín, Colorado, they have this by themes, by topics, you know, science, social studies, mathematics. Here I have an example of just occupations and how they can, you know, look similar uh, in meaning and perhaps in spelling or what are the similarities and what are the differences. But what I want them to do is to dig deeper. So let's bring in uh, the word, you know, the word in English is author. So I've got to make sure they're processing it and saying it correctly. In Spanish, we say autor. How many syllables are in the Spanish word? Put your hand on your chin and say author. In Spanish, autor. My mouth opened twice in Spanish and it opened twice in English. How many sounds in Spanish? Out or four. How many in English? Ah, er, three. How many morphemes or meaning units? Only has one. But if I said authors in Spanish, autores, then it would mean more than one. It would have two. Now, how's that similar or different than an architect, arquitecto? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Let's use it in a sentence. How is it spelled the same? How's it spelled differently? But if you look right here, what did I do? I brought up the phonology. I brought up the vocabulary, I brought in the morphology, I brought in the syntax, I brought in the orthography, right? And I brought in the use. So once again, I'm bringing in those components of language and another routine for the students. We have lots of morphemes that are the same across languages like Spanish and English. And uh, these are just some of the examples and I can do the same kind of routine. So here's my ist artist, pianist, and dentist, artista, pianista, dentista. And so then we bring up, you know, what do you think it could mean? What other words can you come up with? Can we generate some? Can we make a word wall? Can we read something? Can we find these words, parts in this word that we're in, in, in this text that we're reading, right? Can you tell me from your native language? Can you tell me um, in the second language? You know, can we use it? This again is another routine uh, that we're using for our students. 
And then I end here today with what I call 3PV3RQ. And here's something I want to tell you about 3PV3RQ. And I write about this in a book called Multisensory Teaching of Basic Language Skills. And the reason I write 3PV3RQ is because I wanted to take the evidence-based practices of what we know from those national reports that I was describing to you earlier and really help myself design a lesson that I make sure that I'm trying to embed these like eight evidence-based practices to get me to reading comprehension. And for our students, we always start with the purpose in mind. So I always tell them what we're going to be working on. What is the purpose of this reading? We prepare the connection to get to that background knowledge and to have those discussions. What do they know? What don't they know? And we want to make the predictions. Oh, let's look at the title. Let's look at the pictures. Let's look at, you know, some of these first sentences in these paragraphs. And then, of course, the vocabulary. Are there any cognates here? Are there any morphemes here? What are the vocabulary words that I must know to get to the gist of what I'm reading about? And then my three R's. I have the students read. And we actually oftentimes read more than once. So I'm going to maybe read for that accuracy and fluency and then read with a real focus on comprehension. We'll do a review and a discussion and I'll model for them how I might summarize it so that then they can summarize it. In one of our studies, we left out the retail and we didn't get as great of results as when we left it in there. It really solidifies that understanding. And then we not only ask questions, the simple and complex, but we generate, have them generate. And I often have them generate the how or the why or the what if, and they know as they read, I'm going to have to be thinking and thinking about what other questions that I have. And that helps to extend it. So I use this kind of as my lesson plan to make sure I'm covering all those eight best evidence-based practices that are described, you know, in the uh, national uh, reading panel report. And I can do it with something as simple as this passage that I was showing you in um, artisans, right? And Brad, how much more time do I have or am I out of time? I know we started a little bit late. You have eight minutes left, uh, oh, but okay. we have some questions. Oh, um, okay, so let me, I was gonna, close. I was gonna model for them, but it's all right. Um, so I, the other thing, uh, once again, even as we're teaching, if we have to teach those foundational skills, I'm still bringing in opportunities for text that they still cannot read. And we do that through read alouds. And we always have those read alouds connected to what they're learning. And actually we use, you know, even as they were learning science and social studies, we used read alouds and, and we got great results that you can read about in those IES practice guides. But when we do these read alouds, they're always related to what we're learning. And we cover the read alouds through a five day cycle. And the students, um, the students are actually previewing that book with the instruction. Um, we scaffold for that language and provide that as needed. And we want to really help guide the questioning and the discussion so that we are understanding as instructors, what did they comprehend and what didn't. And we also try to bring in these books that were available across languages so that um, if the students, you know, um, you know, didn't have the command. Well, actually we scaffolded for the language in English too, as we did these read alouds, but we also had the books provided in their native language when possible. And that through that, we can incorporate what they're studying about. We can incorporate about their cultures. We can expand that world knowledge, but we can give them the opportunity to listen to that higher level academic language. And remember what I said, reading, right? Supports my language skills, the more I read, the better my language will get, but my language skills support my reading and my understanding. So be knowledgeable about, and you don't have to know the language. I showed you some things in Arabic and Vietnamese and in English and in Spanish, and you capitalize on that native language for the development of the second language. It's an asset. It's wonderful. And consider those goals. As I'm working across all of these areas, consider, just consider, okay, what, you know, what, what would be a great language goal as I'm working here? And what literacy goal do I have, even across the content areas? And bring in those cross-linguistic um, features very, very uh, clearly. Um, so that will be um, so very uh, important. All right. 
So here's some resources uh, that MTSS for ELS.org. And I think I saw Julie Brown come in here. She's my friend and did some of those briefs. Hi, Julie Brown. And dyslexiaida.org and Colorín Colorado, the Meadows Center. At the University of Houston, we now have the C-Cell Center. It's just getting started. It's on adolescent literacy and English learners. And here are some references. And I also have a book um, called uh, Literacy Foundations for English Learners. But what I'd like to end with today is this. Oh, thank you, Brad. <laughs> Yay, Brad. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's excellent. So thank you. I, appre I appreciate you and appreciate this book. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think a lot of this is in that book. So, but I would like to end today before I answer questions to talk to you how literacy is that bridge to equity. And we can do so much in taking advantage of their language and their culture to bring in, but still teaching them all those foundational skills to get them to that journey of that reading comprehension and all the while working on their language skills in a systematic manner, giving them those opportunities. So please be prepared to teach all your students, but it includes these multilingual learners. So thank you so much. And I'll end there. And sorry, we started late, but um, oh, I appreciate uh, everybody. I, I got in through there. as best I could, as best yeah. I could. And <laughs> Julie will answer all the questions. <laughs> thank you, Julie. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. I love her. So much. Yeah. She's my buddy. That was a lot right, of knowledge. There might be some other people, but I just saw her come in. But anyway, I, do. I don't know if Amanda's there, but she's also a friend. All right. That so, was a um, that was a wonderful hour. I appreciate that. I appreciate you so much. And so, a couple of questions that we had in the chat. Uh, the first one is dealing with Spanish screeners. Their district is looking at adopting a Spanish screener. And the two that they're looking at is Easy CBM and Renaissance uh, CBM Spanish. Um, they're noticing that the the question is. Let me get it up here. Is I got to get my glasses on. Sure, Just, sure, sure. Yeah. The test All right, the, Brad. They test the ability to orally segment syllables, but not individual phonemes. Oh, is this geez. adequate? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, so I have to, I have to let you know that I'm an author of a universal screening. So um, we have, um, you know, in Texas, we have the Texas Primary Reading Inventory and the Tehazleyeth, and also I um, was a reviewer with the. Um, the Edel, which Lillian Duran has worked on. Um, and so um, what we know from our studies and also Linnea, Linnea Ari has done studies. Um, all right, here's what I wanna say about this. I'm glad you asked the question. And Juan Jimenez, which he's a, like a guru and Juan has also done these studies in, uh, in, in, in Spain and, uh, and looking at, you know, is it a risk factor, is it a disability? And so one of the things that I will tell you from the body of work is that phonemes matter. And even if the language that when we, for example, like I think we have 50,000 students in these uh, development studies, when we look at that, um, we find that even students that have disabilities such as dyslexia can do the syllables. But when you ask them about the sounds, to blend the sounds together, to tell you sounds in words, they can't do it. So it's such a prediction. And so this is how I say, sounds form syllables. Syllables form words. Words form sentences. Sentences form paragraphs. And so what I want to tell you is, show how the sounds blend and form the syllables, how the syllables blend to form words, right? And, um, and, let's, and it's the students who can't, most of the students are gonna be able to do this, but even our students with dyslexia, they could all do the syllables. It's when they couldn't do the sounds that we could find them. And by the way, we're not finding them. And I know everyone's against the early screenings. I'm not saying to identify them. I'm saying like, okay, so, and, and, I, and I don't really expect it. You know, when we think about the mastery, the ability to really achieve these skills, you know, for sure I have to have it by first grade. In kindergarten, it's not gonna be totally fully developed. No way, right? So maybe some children will but for sure by first grade. And the last thing that develops is those consonant clusters, right? Blue, b, 
ooh, ooh. Just like in speech development, the last thing in speech development are those clusters of sounds, the same thing, the same thing. So I would very much recommend that you find one screener or benchmark or whatever, or if you don't have it, do informal and check that out. Can they process the sounds? Can they blend the sounds? Can they tell you the sounds in the words? That really will give you a good hint there. Thank you, thank you for that. Next question, and this will be our last question because we are running oh, out of time. I got um, off light. <laughs> yeah, yes. Is, is there an infographic about structured literacy for Spanish? Many of my Spanish teachers think structured literacy is only for English and having this yeah. infographic would, in Spanish would so be So I have something yeah. to share with you. So here you go. Oh, um, Juan Jimenez, myself, Sherilyn Duradola, Charlie Haynes, Eric Tritas, we develop standards for teaching Spanish literacy. And you can find those standards, like what does the teacher have to know to teach Spanish literacy? And you can find those standards at um, the International Dyslexia Association and it's called Spanish KPS, the Spanish Knowledge and Practice Standards for Teaching Spanish Literacy. And we have them in English as well. What do, what do teachers, and we want, I, I would love for our universities to provide this wonderful wealth of knowledge to people as you know, pre-service teachers, as well as when they're in service. And it really gets to that matter of what do we have um, in there. And then I'm working on a project that we've been working on um, in this multilingual work group. And we have we're developing, Peggy McCardle is drawing it out and we're, you know, we really weren't, I, I see what you're saying on Spanish. So I hadn't thought about it for the Spanish literacy, but we were really looking at it from a biliteracy point of view and really looking at, you know, the, you know, when we think about that biliteracy uh, and we look around those components of language and we look at those advanced literacy skills, you know, what does this look like? And so there's a bunch of people involved in it. So there's lots of discussion, but very soon we will have that out. Um, uh, in this project that we're working on. But um, I would say it's great to start at those knowledge and practice standards. What do you need to know if you're teaching Spanish literacy? What do you need to know if you're teaching English literacy? And um, so anyway. I and they can find helps. those um, knowledge and practice standards at the IDA? Yeah, so right. um, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, dyslexia, I, you, or you just put knowledge and practice standards, you know, IDA, International mm -hmm. Dyslexia Association, yeah. Spanish KPS. Okay, perfect. Spanish KPS. And it's not a translation. So many people think, no, we would never do a translation. If you're going to teach Spanish literacy, it's related to the structure of the Spanish language. Rich. Yeah. Thank you. What do you Thank need you to that. know? Yeah. I think the last couple of things, Elsa, number one, um, the, the, the participants are asking about the presentation if they could be able to get access to that in the Google folder. Um, and if okay, you, so, two ways you can do it, you can drop it in there yourself or you can send it to okay. me and I can yeah, get I'll it into that it. Google okay. Drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And lastly, everyone, I would totally recommend this book by Elsa, Literacy Foundations for English Learners. Um, many of myself and many leaders in Oregon have been participating in a book study around this book. Thank you very much, Sherry Kendall, who's on this call from the Noma ESD. Fantastic learning in this book. I would get your hands on this, deepen this knowledge that you have here today. So I appreciate you Thank very you. much. Yep. yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. Yep. Of course. Everyone, thank you so much for being Bye. here today.